Rocky Linux is a spiritual successor to CentOS, which was discontinued or replaced by Red Hat in 2020 shortly after their acquisition by IBM. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the new release that is Rocky Linux 8.4. Now, I called it a spiritual successor instead of the successor because CentOS was a community project and a few different successors have cropped up, the other big one being Alma Linux. Rocky Linux is trying to carry on the original CentOS torch and I expect it to be functionally the same as CentOS when we reviewed it last year. And by the way, it's called Rocky Linux after an early CentOS co-founder. A lot of people want Rocky from Rocky and Bullwinkle to be the mascot, but given that it's named in memory of someone, using a mascot like that might be in poor taste. I actually really like the name and overall design of the distro. It looks really professional, like the maintainers know what they're doing with it. And there's two different install mediums. One is a full DVD and the other one is a minimal ISO. The minimal ISO is basically the default headless server with options to add stuff like a desktop and whatnot. The DVD installer is more like a fully offline installer, similar to the OpenSUSE installers if you don't activate the online repositories. The installer itself seems to be the same as the original CentOS installer, but I noticed a couple things didn't work like the help section, and changing the security policy caused the installer to soft lock up for a bit, which is weird. There's a ton of additional software and environments to choose from, which makes it easy to tailor your Rocky Linux install to exactly what you need, if that's your thing. After the install, you can log in and accept the EULA, which is basically just a three clause BSD license. And it has the default GNOME Bootstrap and Welcome app, which is good enough. And once inside, we can see that this is the regular old GNOME desktop. It does have a little Rocky logo next to activities on the top left, and the default backgrounds are pretty slick. It's GNOME 3.32.2 to be exact, and we're running the tried and true Linux kernel 4.18. It's quite an oldie. After the initial startup, Rocky Linux installed is just 4.7 gigabytes, and at idle it was consuming a sizable 1.2 gigabytes of memory. Now there's nothing particularly remarkable about this desktop, it's just a standard fair GNOME desktop. It's pretty much the exact same thing that you would see on like Fedora, like an older version of Fedora, or Red Hat Enterprise, or even Intel's Clear Linux. If you were to install tweaks or extensions, you see that there are some default extensions, but none of them are enabled, so this is just a basic vanilla GNOME desktop. It comes with GNOME software and has automatic updates enabled, so you won't really have to worry about security patches and all that. Rocky comes with a bunch of additional repositories pre-configured but disabled, so if you want whatever's in there, you'll have to enable it. And of course there's RPM Fusion too. Speaking of RPM Fusion though, I needed to install it to install EXFAT support. Never mind that EXFAT support wasn't supported out of the box, the guides I found online suggested that EXFAT Fuse was either in the default repos or could be installed via the EPEL repo, but it wasn't there. So I had to install RPM Fusion, which is easy enough, but EXFAT isn't a special file system or anything, it's been a standard thing for years. When opening archives, some of the archives opened in the archive manager, but others just extracted without any warning. This seems to be a Red Hat thing, because I remember CentOS and I think Fedora does this too. In the way of media codecs, Rocky had trouble playing the M4A and WMA audio formats, as well as the AVI, MP4, MPG, and WMV formats. The GNOME desktop has this handy little hook that suggests you check your repos for codec support, but I have never had good luck with this. Like I could get some codecs to install, but others just wouldn't. Now Flatpak is installed, but no remotes are, so if you want to get the most out of it, you'll need to add something like Flathub to it. App images seem to work alright, though I did see a transient error message when trying to launch or install one of them. So in previous episodes, I would run a Geekbench test and maybe compare it to a previous version or a previous episode, but we're going to skip that for now instead, go straight to the gaming performance section. If you didn't notice already, we're using different hardware for this one. Gone are the days of using low-spec or old-spec bargain bin components. 
This is my Asus PB50 workstation. Now, I was using this as my daily for a little while. It's got a Ryzen 7 3750H processor with integrated Vega graphics, so I should be able to play all of the games I would play normally on my regular computer without much of an issue. Overwatch here is probably the game that I play most, like in general, and I'm playing it here through Lutris using the system's wine prefix and install. You'll have to excuse the fuzzy and grainy footage. I was originally recording this on Solus using NVENC, but that magically broke with a recent driver update and I can't get it working, so I had to use X264 here. The graphics stack uh, seems to be all set up correctly because I didn't have to configure or jostle anything to get it to work, besides installing Lutris itself, which was honestly a bit of a bear, but you're probably not going to be using Rocky Linux to be playing games and stuff anyways. This is more of a test of the graphics stack. The default graphics preset was low, with the resolution scaled down by 50%, and it looks fuzzy but playable. There were times when it stuttered pretty bad, but then it kind of like loosened up and evened out and was actually playable. Mango HUD is very optimistic with its frame rates, and I'm not getting close to what it's actually advertising here. When I adjusted the resolution scaling to 100%, it stuttered pretty bad at first again, but then it got better. It never really went away, but it was playable and we ended up winning the match, so I guess there's that. In Mango HUD, you can see that the temperature has been sitting just under 80 degrees most of the time, and wouldn't you know it that the CPU throttles heavily at 80 degrees, so that might be causing the stuttering. Elder Scrolls Online is another game that I play somewhat frequently, and the character selection screen was pretty choppy, but once we actually dropped into the game, and in Cyrodiil specifically, it was surprisingly smooth. The ever-optimistic Mango HUD was reporting upwards of 70 frames a second, but most of the time I'd say that it was probably 30. It wasn't stuttering like Overwatch was, and I mean, I would call this playable. I would have helped this chap finish his dolmen, but I realized that all of my skills got reset, so all I had was this crummy bow. Moving on, we've got No Man's Sky, which is a native Vulcan game, and the Mango HUD readings were spot on here. No Man's Sky is a very pretty game, and low frame rates really break the immersion, so I don't know if I would call this playable. Or if it's playable, I don't know if I would call it enjoyable. It did run well enough though, and you might get away with running it at 720p instead of 1080 to make the frame rate a bit smoother. And last up, we've got the classic Grand Theft Auto Online, which worked right out of the box. I already have a character, so it may have hiccuped during the character creation section or something, but I installed Grand Theft Auto, launched Grand Theft Auto Online, and boom, I'm playing. I forgot to load Mango HUD in though, but I would say that this was probably around 30 frames a second, and honestly, very playable. So I'm not really a red hat wearing type of husky, and Rocky doesn't really do anything different enough to interest me. The branding is really cool though, and I think that it'll really appeal to people. And honestly, Vanilla Gnome isn't all that bad either. I think that most people will be using CentOS or Rocky as a backend server or something like that, and I mean, given its pedigree, I don't see how it could go wrong. The main thing it has going against it is the old kernel version. Application and libraries can be updated using third-party repos and stuff like that, but kernels can be a bit more tricky. For what it's worth, CentOS isn't completely gone, there's CentOS Stream, but everybody's talking about Rocky and Alma, and people don't seem to be very excited about CentOS Stream. We'll probably take a look at that later on, but right now looking at Rocky, eh. I think Rocky is a good replacement for CentOS. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of Distro Delves, and if you did, be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe. No, really, though, your support does mean a lot to me, and if you want more Distro Delving content, I live stream here from time to time, usually at Sundays at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you want to support my work, you are welcome to follow me on Patreon or buy me a coffee on Coffee. I appreciate all your support. And thanks for watching.